program is a video presentation via Zoom of the Civil War Roundtable of the District of Columbia. Founded in 1951, the Roundtable hosts monthly presentations at a location near Washington, D.C., more recently at the Fort Myer Officers Club. For more information, go to www.cwrtdc.org. First of all, I formally welcome everyone to the meeting. I see we're up to 78 participants already, so we're really, really excited that we're able to attract such a large audience. Okay, so Gail uh, Stevens has a bachelor's degree in international politics from George Washington University in 1994 as a member of the Senior Executive Service. So upon retirement, Gail was able to indulge in her lifelong history of the American Civil War, which a lot of us have. Uh, she volunteered at Monocacy National Battlefield for over 15 years, lectured on the Civil War and the Battle of Monocacy, and gave battlefield tours. And she wrote articles for numerous publications. Her book on the Lincoln commander at the Battle of Monocacy Shadow of Shiloh, Major General Lew Wallace, Civil War was published in 2010. Uh, New Mexico connection there too. In uh, 2011, she won the New York City Civil War Forum's uh, William Henry Seward Award for Best Civil War Biography. Gail and her husband moved to Albuquerque in 2016, currently a volunteer at the Coronado Historic uh, Site and she, the Pueblo there, and she's written soon to be published monograph on the evacuation of an ancient Pueblo and the recovery of the 15th century murals found in the Pueblo. So that's quite a background and uh, let me introduce and uh, proud to do so, Gail Stevens. Thanks, John. All right, here we go. So happy to be here and actually, the monograph is about the excavation of an ancient Pueblo, not the evacuation thereof. Um, it's an interesting time to give this talk because of course tomorrow night is the 156th anniversary of the Lincoln assassination. I am not, I'm gonna emphasize at the beginning, a Lincoln scholar. I'm a civil war scholar um, with, as John told you, an interest in a specialty in Jubal Early's 1864 campaign, the Battle of Monocacy, and Major General Lew Wallace, who was the Union commander at the Battle of Monocacy. Now, Wallace was also on the military commission, and he's the person who got me started on this, if you will, sort of sideline. Um, Wallace actually um, was pretty bored during the trial, especially during the daily reading of the transcript. And he did a lot of pen and ink drawings of the conspirators, which he turned into a very interesting painting in 1868. I looked at that painting and I thought, I gotta go know more about these people and more about what happened. So that's the start of my talk tonight, Conspiracy, the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln. On the night of April 11th, 1865, a crowd of jubilant citizens gathered on the White House lawn to hear President Lincoln speak. Two days earlier, Lee had surrendered the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia to U.S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. The surrender of Lee and his army seemed to signal the end of the war. So a celebratory speech from Lincoln was expected. However, Lincoln instead mused thoughtfully about the future of the United States, including a proposal, which is on the screen here, that some black men be given the right to vote. Now, John Wilkes Booth attended this speech. And at the end of the speech, he turned to his companion and exclaimed, that means nigger citizenship. Now, by God, I will put him through. That will be the last speech he will ever make. Booth kept his word. Three days later on April 14, he shot Abraham Lincoln while the president was watching a play at Ford's Theater. 
That same night, Booth Associates Lewis Powell and George Atzerodt were to kill Secretary of State William Stewart and Vice President Andrew Johnson. Both men failed. The Lincoln assassination was quite simply a crucial event in American history. Lincoln the deft politician who had led the Union ably through a great civil war was murdered, leaving divisive and complex issues. Most importantly, the future of the freed people and of the vanquished Confederacy to far less able men. All lacked Lincoln's vision, political ability and intellect. And instead of using victory to propel the nation forward, they fought each other and lost valuable time that this nation, quite frankly, has not yet recovered. So who were the accused conspirators? Well, first, clearly the mastermind, John Wilkes Booth, a famous actor. David Harold, a pharmacist and an avid hunter who knew the back roads of Southern Maryland well. George Atzerodt, who had made a living during the war moving men and material across the Potomac River from Confederate Maryland to Union, Virginia. Lewis Powell, who was the brawn of the effort, former Confederate soldier, went also by an alias, Lewis Payne. Lewis Payne was six foot two in an era when your average male was five seven. He weighed 170 pounds in an era when your average male weighed around 147, 150. So he was a huge man and he was all muscle. Mary Surratt, a tavern owner and the owner of a boarding house in Washington, DC. Her son, John Surratt Jr., who basically brought Mary into the plot. Uh, John Surratt Jr. was a Confederate courier um, who took who had access to high echelons of the Confederacy and who basically took material, took Confederate messages from Virginia to the Confederate mission in Canada. Edmund Spangler, a carpenter and a stagehand at Ford's Theater. Michael O'Laughlin, a childhood friend of Booth's and a former Confederate soldier. Samuel Arnold, also a childhood friend of Booth's and a former Confederate soldier. And finally, Samuel Mudd, a physician and a very prominent member of the Confederate network in Southern Maryland. John Wilkes Booth was the leader of the conspiracy, who was a famous actor and an intelligent, daring man whose theory that the defeat of his beloved South knew no bounds. As you can see by the first two quotes here on the screen, he was handsome, he was wealthy, he was charismatic, and he led his motley circle of conspirators with ease. He believed passionately in the superiority of Southern society and the rightness of the Southern cause, that is slavery. And he believed Lincoln was a tyrant who had used every means to destroy his country, that is the Confederacy. Now, he also said, interesting, this quote, the third quote here grabbed me, because this is one of those things, God made me do it, which is just one of those moments of narcissism that it indicates what Booth thought about himself as much as anything. Um, his Booth's co-conspirators were also dedicated supporters of the South. Three of them, after all, had been Confederate soldiers and two of them were Confederate agents. Now Booth had planned to sign up to fight for the South, but his mother begged him not to, and he did not. So when Lincoln was renominated in 1864, Booth decided to do something. Um, his first plan was to kidnap Lincoln, take him south to Richmond, where he would be, be exchanged for all the Confederate prisoners in un, Union hands, which obviously would have been a huge boost uh, for the Confederate army. 
In August 1864, Booth began to act on his kidnapping plan, recruiting his two childhood friends from Baltimore, Michael O'Laughlin and Samuel, Samuel Arnold. Both men, as I said, had served in the Confederate Army and were, as the and were of the same mind as Booth about Lincoln, so they immediately agreed to participate. Booth got sick in September 1864, so it wasn't until October that he traveled to Montreal to contact the Confederate officials there, tell them of his plans and get their help. They clearly agreed to help him. He came back with $1,500, about $24,000 in today's currency, and just as important, a letter of introduction to members of the Confederate network in Southern Maryland. Southern Maryland was quite simply the best route to take a kidnapped president to Virginia and on to Richmond. Back in Maryland, Booth moved to recruit additional conspirators. He first took his letter of introduction and went to visit Samuel Mudd, who, as I said, was a prominent member of the Confederate network in Southern Maryland. Mudd introduced him to John Surratt. John Surratt, in turn, introduced Booth to David Harold and George Atzerodt. And finally, John Surratt recruited Lewis Powell. We're not sure how he knew Powell, but he recruited Lewis Powell, who was in Baltimore at the time. Now this Confederate underground network in Southern Maryland was quite important because it also moved information, men and materiel through Maryland, which was after all a union state. So the last conspirator is Mary Surratt. Um, and this Booth's recruitment of John Surratt Jr. led to Mary's participation in the group and the use of her boarding house in downtown Washington as a meeting place. John boarded with her and that's why he recruited her, obviously. And he organized several meetings involving Booth, as well as Atzerodt, Harold, and Powell at the boarding house with Mary's full knowledge. Booth eventually came to talk to Mary privately several times, and he gave Mary, as we shall see, some tasks. Mary had allowed her tavern in Southern Maryland to be used as a center of secessionist activity, and she agreed to allow the kidnappers to hide weapons they thought they would need for um, the kidnapping in her tavern, including, including two carbines, which would be important in, Booth's, in Booth's escape. So Booth and his co-conspirators were finally ready in early 1865. Though they made several kidnapping plans, their plans came close to fruition only once on March 17, 1865. Booth had learned that Lincoln would be visiting a hospital and visiting wounded soldiers at a hospital in Washington, which was near a major route into Southern Maryland. He was able to gather his men at a nearby restaurant from which they would launch their attempt. Booth then went to the hospital and to find out Lincoln's schedule. Um, what he found out was that Lincoln had canceled the visit. So that kidnapping plan went down the tubes. Now we don't know when Booth made the decision to um, assassinate, but we do know that as of March 27, he actually was thinking still about kidnapping because on March 27, he sent a telegram to uh, Samuel Arnold and Michael O'Laughlin in Baltimore saying, come to Washington, we have work to do. But then of course, uh, Richmond was evacuated on April 2nd, Lee surrendered on April 9. And somewhere in that time period, Booth decided he would assassinate Lincoln. So on the morning of April 14, Booth found out from a newspaper that Lincoln would be, uh, Lincoln and his wife 
would be attending the theater that night at Ford's and accompanied by U.S. Grant and his wife. Now, we all know that U.S. Grant and his wife pulled out and went to New Jersey to see their children instead. This is the perfect site of the crime for Booth because Booth had acted many times at Ford's Theater. He and the manager were good friends. And so he had ready entree to the theater and he knew its interior setup. He also knew that Lincoln would be lightly guarded. Lincoln did not believe that heavy security could prevent a determined assassin from killing him. And so he ignored the pleas of Secretary of War Stanton to increase his security detail. So Booth would strike that night. That afternoon, Booth went to the boarding house, visited with Mary Surratt, and gave her a package which contained his binoculars. She promptly hired a buggy and traveled to her tavern in Southern Maryland, where she told her tavern keeper the article would be picked up that night. This act would be crucial in convicting her. Um, then early that evening, Booth met with Lewis Powell, George Atzerodt, and David Harold and conveyed the plan. He would kill Lincoln. Atzerodt would kill Vice President Johnson. Powell was to kill Secretary of State Seward. Atzerodt required no help. He knew DC well. Powell needed a guide. And that guide was going to be David Harold because Powell did not know Washington, D.C. well. So Harold would guide Powell to Seward's house, wait for Powell to kill Seward, and then guide Powell to a rendezvous with Booth in Maryland. A little after 9.30 p.m., Booth rode into an alley in the rear of Ford's theater. The play had already started. Booth dismounted, Seeing Edmund Spangler, handed the reins of his horse to Edmund Spangler, who worked, who worked as a carpenter in the theater and a stagehand. The two men exchanged a few words and then Booth went into the theater. That would be a very expensive conversation for Edmund Spangler. So Booth made his way to the presidential box, shot Lincoln, and famously jumped from the box onto the stage yelling, Seek Semper Tyrannus, or thus always to tyrants, telling the world what he thought of Lincoln. The leap cost Booth, he broke a small bone in his left leg. Lincoln was carried across the street to the Peterson house where he died early the next morning. Secretary of State Seward was actually quite lucky. Lewis Powell, again, this huge man, forced his way into Stewart's house. He was armed with a revolver and a bowie knife. He bludgeoned uh, Stewart's two sons, Stewart's nurse, and a State Department employee. And then he went to attack Stewart. Now, Stewart had been in a carriage accident. His torso was bandaged. Um, Powell drew his knife, slashed at Seward, and cut his cheek and part of his neck. But Seward had the presence of mind in the middle of all this to simply roll off the bed to the other side. And by this time, Powell could see that the four uh, helpers, the four people who had been there, were coming up, coming toward him. So he simply ran out of the house ran out of the house only to find that David Harold, hearing the screams in the house, had fled with um, his horse, Powell's horse. So Powell was left alone in Washington, DC. George Atzerodt, who was staying in the same hotel as Vice President Johnson, was simply supposed to walk upstairs and shoot, knock on the door and when Johnson answered it, shoot him. But Atzerodt lost his nerve. He never even tried. He rode out of town um, on the lamb, as they say. Now, over the next few days, Mary Surratt, Mudd, O'Laughlin, Arnold, and Edmund Spangler were arrested by members of the huge military and police contingent, the manhunt, if you will, that Secretary of War Edwin Stanton had put together to find the uh, assassins. 
John Surratt avoided capture. He had been ordered late in March by the Confederate um, government. His contact, by the way, was Secretary of State Judah Benjamin to go to Canada and was, and was in Canada at the time of the assassination. Booth eluded the manhunt. He shot Lincoln in front of a theater full of witnesses, galloped away on a horse and vanished to parts unknown. The failure over the next several days of several thousand pursuers to hunt down Lincoln's assassin became a embarrassment to the government. So on April 20th, six days after the assassination, Stanton offered a $100,000 reward for the capture of Booth, Harold, and Atzerodt or information that led to the capture of these men. This is a staggering sum in a day when most people, when the average worker made a dollar a day, um, brought in a lot of information and was ultimately divided up between the people most credited for the capture uh, and death of Booth and his accomplices. Um, Atzerodt, by the way, was actually seized on the 20th of April. So where were Booth and Harold? Well, Harold met Booth at the prearranged spot, South Washington, DC, about 11.30 PM. Booth badly needed a doctor for his leg and they headed to the home, toward the home of their co-conspirator, Samuel Mudd. Now they needed, they also needed Mudd because Mudd would inject them in to the agent network to help them get across the river and into Virginia. They stopped on the way by Mary Surratt's tavern where they picked up one of the carbines and Mary and Booth's binoculars. They arrived at Mudd's house early on April 15. Mudd set the broken bone, harbored both men for a day. After sunset on April 15, Booth and Harold left to head to the next spot where Mudd was sending them. And using the Confederate network in Southern Maryland, the men made their way across the Potomac River and into Virginia and in what they believed was safety. Now, during this period, Booth had access to newspapers. Um, and he read in them that the public did not really share his view of him as a hero, which amazingly surprised him, but also depressed him. He wrote in a small pocket guide that he was carrying with him that she, he should be honored like Brutus for killing a great tyrant. All right, the afternoon of April 24, finds Booth and Harold um, asking for shelter at Richard Garrett's farm, about 20 miles south of the Potomac River. Booth badly needed to rest. His leg was really, he was really in pain from his leg. And they wanted to stay a couple days. Um, they did not know that a portion of the 16th New York Cavalry led by Colonel Everton Conger was hard on their trail uh, and had been sent to do so by Stan. So early on the morning of April 26, the 16th New York honed in on their targets. Um, now Booth and Harold were actually locked in the Garrett's tobacco barn. They had become very suspicious of Booth and Harold. They feared Booth and Harold were going to steal their horses. So they sent them on the night of the 25th to stay in the tobacco barn for their safety and locked them in the tobacco barn. When the 16th New York arrived the next day, they immediately gave up Booth and Harold. The 16th New York moved on the barn demanded that the men inside surrender and Harold did immediately. Booth would not surrender. So uh, the cavalrymen set the barn of fire. They could see Booth inside with a Colt revolver and a carbine. Um, and Booth still refused to surrender. A cavalryman, cavalryman 
shot him in, uh, it shot him and severed his spinal cord. Booth died shortly thereafter. So Booth, the man who had actually shot Lincoln was dead, but the eight conspirators were in government hands. Again, only John Surratt had escaped. He would remain at large, st spending some time as part of the papal guard uh, until he was captured in Egypt in December, 1866. He would return to the US, be given a civ civilian trial in Washington, DC, which ended in a hung jury. But this was right after the assassination. And the investigation and the trial were driven by the anger of the Northern public. The man who had guided them to victory through a terrible war had been snatched away. It seemed to the Northern public like a dark conspiracy to rob the North of victory. Uh, citizens in the North looked on this as the last act of a defeated and treacherous cause and assumed the leaders of the Confederate government must be responsible. Calls for vengeance were the order of the day. Now, to some of us, that might seem like, well, isn't that a bit of an overreaction? Well, it isn't if you think about how we reacted to 9-11. Uh, what would our reaction have been had any of the perpetrators of that particular event been captured soon after the event. Now, it's also important to note here that when Booth assassinated Lincoln, there were still Confederate armies in the field and Jefferson Davis and his cabinet, though no longer in Richmond, had not yet been captured. So to the North, the war was not over on April 15, nor even on April 17, the date of this newspaper. So you have public anger and a thirst for vengeance underscored by a concern that the Confederacy might still reconstitute itself. So it's really no surprise that the new president, Andrew Johnson, the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, Attorney General Speed, and Judge Advocate General Holt decided the conspirators should be tried by a military commission. The attorney general issued a finding that the accused were enemy belligerents whose conspiracy had as its aim the furtherance of a military goal, namely to adversely affect the Northern war effort. Now, to many in the anxious and vengeful atmosphere which hovered over the North after Lincoln's assassination, the military trial seemed appropriate. There were those believed that the defendants should be tried in a civilian court. They were civilians. But most people believed a military commission appropriate. As one New York Times correspondent put it, this is a quote, it is the nature of the crime and not the dress of the criminal that determines the tribunal by which he may be tried. So military commission it is a military commission. It was a judicial body composed of officers designed to work in enemy areas where the civilian government was suspended or in areas under martial law. Such commissions could try both military and civilian personnel. They became quite common after Lincoln's September 1862 revocation of the writ of habeas corpus, suspension, sorry, of the writ of habeas corpus which required military trials for all civilians engaging in activity supportive of the Confederacy or who were, quote, guilty of any disloyal practice against the authority of the United States. Judge Advocate General Joseph Holt, head of the Bureau of Military Justice, played a crucial role in the trial. He's pictured here on the far right. He helped select the members of the commission, frame the charges against the conspirators, question many of the witnesses during the trial, and generally oversaw the conduct of the trial. Holt was the nation's chief administrator of military law and as such directed the military court system. 
Lincoln had appointed Holt. He was a man known for his brilliant legal mind, his integrity, and his wholehearted devotion to the Union. Now to Holt's left in the picture, Colonel Henry Burnett, Judge John Bingham, were the assistant judge advocates for this trial and were the prosecutors of the trial. The commission, these are the nine actual military members of the commission, names on the chart. Their president was the highest ranking officer. That was Major General David Hunter here in the center with the sword. And here's Major General Lou Wallace. He was the only member of the commission who was a lawyer. Um, all nine of the officers had seen combat service during the war and all of them certainly had a strong attachment to the Union and to Abraham Lincoln. Military commissions were not kangaroo courts. There were standard rules of procedure and meticulous record keeping, which was not always the case in the civilian trials of the period. The trial closely followed civil law and both prosecution and defense attorneys referred to civil precedent in making their cases. The record of the court was reviewed by Holt every day for correct application of the law. If the death penalty was ordained, then the president of the United States had to review the entire trial record. However, they were different from civilian courts in important ways. Holt and his two assistant judge advocates controlled who was called as a defense witness and provided legal advice to the commission. In addition, hearsay testimony and leading questions were allowed. Now this bothered me as I got into this, but this is, these are the principles con and the conduct of military justice as written. And they relied heavily, these, the principles, upon the concept of officers as men of honor, men who would, as the slide says here, get at the truth. Um, thus, hearsay testimony and leading questions were allowed because the officers, men of intelligence and honor, would naturally be objective. That seems foreign to us, but that was a widely held belief in the 19th century. So what were the charges? Conspiracy. Um, a conspiracy to kill Lincoln, Johnson, Seward, and Grant, thus depriving the US of its leadership. They would also be providing aid and comfort to the rebellion and aiding in the subversion and overthrow of the Constitution. All the defendants pleaded not guilty. So what was a conspiracy? What does conspiracy mean? The general conspiracy was described as a crime in which two or more persons conspire to commit any offense against the US or any agency thereof, for any manner, or any purpose. The four elements on the slide had to exist to constitute a conspiracy. Two parties, an illegal goal. The parties had to have a knowledge of the conspiracy and agree to participate in the conspiracy. And at least one conspirator's commission have an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. A person might be a member of an unlawful conspiracy without knowing all the details of the conspiracy or even the other members. If a person understood the plan was unlawful and willingly joined, it was sufficient to convict the individual cons for conspiracy, even if they played only a small part. The law also stated that if a felony was committed in furtherance of the conspiracy, even though the original goal might have been a misdemeanor, the charge was the commission of the felony. Now, this is an interesting part. The law also involved the concept of vicarious responsibility. That is, anyone in a conspiracy was responsible for the actions of another. Finally, a person could withdraw from a conspiracy only by making a meaningful effort 
to prevent its successful conclusion. For example, they had to report it to the authorities. Now, over the course of the trial, Mudd, Mary Surratt, Arnold, and O'Loughlin fell victim to these provisions of conspiracy, particularly vicarious responsibility. Now, whether these people knew what agreeing to, to join Booth in his conspiracy, where it would lead them, I doubt. Because they, they only knew that Lincoln wished, that, that Booth wished to do Lincoln harm, though, and they did nothing to stop it. But if you, if you think about this, if you take a step back and think about it, and you think about these people, they both engaged them in a vast web. And I think surely they did not understand that. Both goals. Now the trial opened on the 9th of May and concluded with sentencing on the 30th of June, 1865. Um, Holt believed there must be a connection between the conspirators and officials of the Confederate government particularly Jefferson Davis and the Confederate representatives in Canada, who he had believed had in, been involved in a vast conspiracy to undermine the Union war effort. Um, note that this second goal here, to uncover any relevant connections between the individual defendants and the members of the Confederate leadership, were, was the reason that Holt needed John Surratt Jr. As I said, John Surratt Jr. had access to the highest levels of the Confederate leadership. He carried very important information and he probably would have known more about what was going on. However, they never captured Surratt. So what Holt had to do was simply ignore the last two, the last two of his goals, give up on the last two goals here, and focus on proving the precise role of each of the eight that each of the eight prisoners had played in the assassination. The defense attorneys were described by the press as a sound and accomplished group of lawyers. Now, two of the defense lawyers should be mentioned in particular: Maryland Senator Senator Reverdy Johnson, who was Mary Surratt's chief counsel and Union General Thomas Ewing Jr., who was the chief counsel for uh, Edmund Spangler, Arnold and O'Loughlin. Both of them were well-known lawyers. So during the trial, a total of 366 wit witnesses testified. The evidence against Powell, Harold, and Atzerodt was firm. Harold was caught with Booth. Paul was identified by everybody in the Seward house as the, as the attempted, the perpetrator of the attempted assassination. Now, Atzer wrote, uh, talk too much. He left town, headed to Northwest, up toward Rockville and beyond, where he knew a lot of people. And he simply talked too much. He talked too knowingly about the assassination. So those three were going to hang, or those th three were going to be found guilty. The evidence against Edmund Spangler was relatively weak, and ultimately he was found not guilty of the charge of conspiracy, but he was found guilty of aiding and abetting Booth in his escape. Ewing, the defense attorney for Arnold and O'Loughlin, presented a strong argument that neither of them could have known of the assassination attempt. In fact, Arnold had accepted a job and was working at Fortress Monroe in Virginia from late March into the uh, until he was he was brought in. However, they had both participated in the kidnapping. They knew Booth wished Lincoln harm, and they had done nothing to report the plot. Remember, vicarious responsibility. What I'm going to do, do now is concentrate on the most controversial of convictions, which of course is Mary Surratt and Samuel Mudd. Lewis Weichman and John Lloyd were the crucial witnesses in the case against Mary Surratt. Weichman was a friend of John Surratt's. They had gone to college together. 
He was also a government employee and a member of a Union Reserve Regiment, whom John Surratt asked to come board in his mother's boarding house. So he witnessed the comings and goings of the conspirators, um, including Booth. Now, I cannot figure out why, where John Surratt's mental processes went here. He, Weichmann was a government employee and a member of a Union Reserve Regiment. What did he think Weichmann was gonna do? Anyway, Weichmann saw much and most of his testimony was corroborated by other witnesses. Uh, most importantly, it was Lewis Weichmann, excuse me, Weichmann, who accompanied Mary Surratt on two visits to her tavern, one on April 11 and the other on April 14. On April 11, three days before the assassination, Weichmann testified that he took her to the tavern on an errand. John Lloyd, the other important witness, was the man who leased Mary's tavern. He testified that she told him to have the two carbines ready for unidentified persons who would soon stop to pick them up. Weichmann testified that he again took her to the tavern on the afternoon of April 14, hours after he, Weichmann, had seen Booth give Mary Surratt a package, the package which contained Booth's binoculars. And Weichmann saw that Mary carefully brought that package with her. Um, John Lloyd then testified that Mary Surratt gave him the package and told him to have the package and the carbines, carbines ready for parties who would be there tonight to pick them up. Mary's problem here was that she had willingly done booth bidding and her statement to Lloyd that parties would be by to pick them up that night indicated she knew Booth was going to act on the night of April 14. Her case was not helped by the fact that Powell showed up at her boarding house on March 17. Remember Lewis Powell lost in Washington on April 17 when military detectives were there. Powell knocked on the door, a military detective opened it. Here's this huge man. Military detectives were by that time very familiar with who Lewis Powell was. They took him into the room. Mary immediately said, I don't know this man. Powell said, but don't you remember, you hired me to dig a ditch, thereby making mush of Mary's denial. They also went through Mary's records, boarding house records, and found that Powell had actually boarded there, as had Harold and Atzerodt. Um, so when Weichmann and Lloyd finished testifying and the military detectives finished testifying about Powell, the evidence against Mary Surratt, Surratt was virtually insurmountable by her defense. Mudd's defense was based on his status as a doctor and a landowner and his appearance as a gentleman. And he certainly did look different than the remainder of the male conspirators. He admitted to setting Booth's leg early on the morning of April 15 and allowing Booth and Harold to stay at his house. But he said they were total strangers to him. His problem first was that several witnesses testified to his activities as a Confederate agent. He had also been seen with Booth several times, both in Southern Maryland and in Washington, DC. Booth was a famous and recognizable man. Finally, two of his neighbors testified that they had met Mudd riding into a nearby town on April 15 and told him that Lincoln had been assassinated by Booth. Uh, at this time, remember, Booth was still at Mudd's house and there were federal troopers in town, but Mudd did nothing. Uh, now what he did was he waited another full day. He was having Easter dinner with his unionist cousin the next day. And he said, you know, there are these guys at my house the other night, one had his legs set. And I'm just wondering if they didn't have something to do with Lincoln's assassination. Now, would you tell the union authorities 
They will believe you because they know you're a unionist. They will probably not believe me because they know I'm a Confederate sympathizer. Um, well, these actions convicted Mudd ultimately. So it was clear that Powell, Atzerodt, and Harold would be sentenced to death. Mudd, Mary Surratt, Arnold, O'Loughlin, and Spangler were more difficult. Now, on April 20, on June 26, with testimony completed, Lou Wallace wrote his wife. And there is this interesting tidbit in the letter. Judge Bingham on the side of the government speaks tomorrow, and then the commission votes guilty or not guilty. I have passed a few words with my associate members and think we can agree in a couple of hours at farthest. Three, if not four, of the eight will be acquitted. That is, they would be if we voted today. What effect Bingham will have remains to be seen. Now, I think three are obvious, Spangler, Arnold, and O'Loughlin. Mudd, Mary Surratt, who knows, the fourth. <clears throat> Bingham did change their minds. First, he reviewed the evidence against each of the conspirators. Some of the members of the commission said it agonizingly long, agonizing detail. But he concluded with an important reminder about the law pertaining to conspiracies. Namely, in this quote, what these conspirators did in the execution of the conspiracy by the hand of one of their co-conspirators, they did themselves. His act done in the prosecution of the common design was the act of all the parties to the treasonable combination. So what happened? Well, Edmund Spangler was sentenced to six years in prison. Maud Arnold and O'Loughlin were sentenced to life imprisonment. All four were imprisoned in Fort Jefferson in the dry Tortugas of Florida, a perfect hell hole as the soldier, soldier station there called it. It was swept often by epidemics of yellow fever. In fact, O'Loughlin died there in 1867 of yellow fever. Mon Arnold and uh, Spangler were actually quite lucky. They were pardoned by President Johnson during the last days of his presidency in 1869. Mary Surratt was condemned to death and became the first woman to be hanged by the federal government. There is a theory that Mary Surratt was condemned to death in hopes that her plight would convince her son, John, to give himself up. That did not happen. Thus, it is possible Mary Surratt died, at least in part, because of her son. Five members of the commission did request clemency for Mary Surratt, but President Johnson did not give it. So I told you all that Lou Wallace painted a painting and that led me to this talk. Um, if you stand and look at this painting and you're not really familiar with this, you think a lot of things. The first thing is, look at the size of Lewis Powell. It's huge. Well, I know he was huge, but why did Wallace paint him in such a imposing way? Well, Wallace, first of all, you all have to remember, this is dramatic. And Wallace was the man who wrote Ben-Hur. So Wallace loved drama. Um, Wallace said that he painted him like that because during the trial, Powell showed himself to be a desperate character who, whenever he found himself the object of attention during the trial, would draw himself up to his full proportions and glare at the crowd like a caged tiger. Now, I also believe the relative positions of the conspirators, after looking at this for a long time and reading a lot, tell you something about what Wallace thought about their relative guilt. Notice Edmund Spangler all the way over there by himself. I think Wallace did not think Spangler was really guilty of conspiracy. So now you have Laughlin, Harold, Powell, Atzerodt, Arnold, all in basically a secondary, the upper tier, if you will. And right down here in the front, John Wilkes Booth, 
Samuel Mudd and John Surratt, right in the center of the painting. Someone asked Wallace, I found this letter by looking in a lot of strange places. Someone asked Wallace about this painting and this particular part of it. And Wallace said, they are there because they were the brains of the conspiracy. And that's a quote. Thus Wallace seems to have believed Mudd's guilt was graver than his uh, colleagues did. And last thing everybody notices right away, Mary Surratt's not there. And Wallace always did, and I really don't think this is a very good excuse, um, that he never saw Mary Surratt to draw her. It is true that Mary was uh, heavily veiled in black every day, but she was forced to lift that veil every day so people knew that it was Mary Surratt under that veil, that she had not been somehow escaped and been replaced. Wallace drew all of the other conspirators, uh, with the exception of Booth, obviously. Um, and I find, again, I find this unconvincing because he could have seen her every day and because there were lots of other pen and ink drawings done during the trial. I believe Lou Wallace, who did not sign the, at, sign the petition for clemency, felt guilt about Mary Surratt's death. Well, the conspirators were hanged on the 7th of July, on the 7th of July, 1865. And this was part of a New York Times editorial. The comment has proved needless to say, to be untrue. The outcome of the trial has been controversial since the day the editorial was written, particularly on two counts, Mary Surratt. Public sentiment concerning the hanging of Mary Surratt began to change almost immediately. There was a burst of sympathy at the hanging of a woman, guilty or not. Many in mid 19th century America found the act abhorrent even if they believe deeply in Mary Surratt's guilt and the need to punish her somehow. Now, in light of the evidence and the law regarding conspiracy, as far as I'm concerned, there's little doubt about Mary Surratt's guilt. But was it justice and was it appropriate, particularly consider, consider, considering the treatment of Samuel Mudd to hang Mary Surratt. So my question, which I posed to all of you to think about, was it justice to hang Mary Surratt? The other issue is the use of the military commission. Certainly Lincoln had essentially authorized it in his September 1862 suspension in the writ of habeas corpus, but it seems quite foreign to us for the military to try civilians even though the members of this group certainly had participated in a plot which ended in the first assassination of a U.S. president. So I asked the question, was the use of a military commission to try these civilians appropriate? Now, all this, I think, leads to the overarching issue of public anger. I think it is important for all of us to think about the role the public's need for vengeance played in the trial of the Lincoln conspirators and how the very human need for vengeance fits or doesn't fit with the American concept of a free and fair trial by one's peers. It's just an important question I pose for citizens of a democracy. So what I've tried to do tonight is to give you a look at the who, what, when, where, why, and how of the hunt for the conspirators, conspirators and their ultimate end. I hope I've given you some food for thought. And I will close with a list of the books that I found to the, be the best on the assassination. Um, Ed Steers Cannot Be Beat, very important one here, Come Retribution by Tid, uh, Tidwell Hall and Gaddy. Very deeply looking at the Confederates in Maryland, the Confederate networks, and their connection with the Lincoln conspirators. <clears throat> and finally, of course, I can't help mentioning and showing you a picture of my book. Uh, and I hope some of you have read it and will read it. Thank you.
and I'm ready for questions. And I'll stop the share, Kurt. Thank you very much for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And we have a few lawyers here. Oh, and God. I'm sure that, <laughs> and oh, I'm sure, no. Yeah. <laughs> and you've covered <laughs> one thing because. about whether there should be a, a military tribunal for civilians. Um, but one thing you mentioned, I just want to uh, point this out, is the standard. They were using the standard for conspiracy. That's a legal cons conspiracy. But today in the practice of law, we do have a standard of justice of, uh, you know, doing the right thing. But that applies for to arbitrators. Arbitrators are not subject to a requirement to do things according to the law, but according to what they feel is um, uh, the right the right response and to make a recommendation. But I don't know. I'm not a don't do that kind of law. But I think you can still still appeal it. You can still maybe take it to a higher court. And um, and also arbitration doesn't usually involve a crime. It's some sort of business dealing. So maybe uh, Paul Severance had a lot of legal questions. Paul, if you want to open your mic. And by the way, you can open your mic if you have a keyboard just by pressing the space bar. And when you release the space bar, you'll go back to mute. That's the best way to remember to unmute. But Paul, you uh, you mentioned that uh, um, that there's not a that uh, the military commission is not considered a court, and so there's no appeal of the military commission. Do you have any points you want to make, uh, Paul, about that issue, or any yeah, other? Uh, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, obviously, at the courtroom, probably 35, 40 percent of the groups I get there are lawyers. That's a lot of fun if you get my drink. <laughs> I sympathize. <laughs> you know, and uh, I like to tell everybody that we now have a, 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 a special sushi for lawyers. It's called Sosumi. And it's 99% <laughs> <and it's 99 laughs> shark meat. So anyway. Um, oh, my God. Yeah. I had a, a group oh, oh, come in from the um, Air Force JAG and said, well, under Article 3 of the um, Constitution, military tri tribunals under the Articles of War of 1862 and the Lever Code were not considered legal courts in the same sense as the Constitution derived it. And, and thus, there was no app appellate authority to SCOTUS. And, if you, and the other argument is that because Johnson appointed all nine members of the commissions and the three prosecutors by executive order, that was the only appellate authority. And Gail pointed out, I mean, you know, Johnson wasn't interested in hearing, uh, you know, appeals, including that, that plea for leniency that was signed by five members of the uh, tribunal and two of the prosecutors. Right. Uh, post uh, post trial, so it, it's really kind of interesting uh, to kind of figure that out. I, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but um, it's it's it, it's interesting to I, I've over the years have accumulated 15, 20 different anomalies, as I call yeah. them, about the trial, and and uh, and boy, I thought Gail did a great job. You know, Thank you, bringing Paul. us. Thank you. That's why I bring up the issue of um, the public need for vengeance. I, Gary Gallagher, many, many years ago, said to me, if you do not put yourselves in their shoes, you will never understand what they did and why they did it. Yeah. And so I you, when you read the newspapers, um, when you read the letters of someone like Lou Wallace, people wanted vengeance. They called it justice, and I'm not sure it wasn't justice, except in the case of Samuel Mudd, um, yeah. given and, and the crime. But it's something, that's what I always try to do when I'm trying to think of these events. Think about how the people then felt. What were they yeah. thinking? Because then you can understand, and it, it comes then to that point of, Public vengeance is a very 
powerful push. And that's something we all need to think about all the time. Yeah, and, and I agree. I mean, I think, I think the, uh, the focus for revenge was more important than justice per se. And if you read um, the uh, newspaper accounts, they're really, really vivid. Yes. Uh, they are like the National Enquirer, yes. uh, you know, and uh, it, it's um, it's really interesting to to try and gauge the mood of the nation at that time from a social perspective and how that influenced, the, you know, the tribunal and how Judge Holt and Bingham and Burnett, you know, conducted the uh, trial. So let me uh, ask Bill too, because I think this is important to go along with that. And that is uh, getting back to the lawyer side is, um, I, I'm wondering <laughs> if, if you had looked at this from a legal perspective rather than this justice perspective, uh, even though you have the conspiracy, whether you would have the same finding if it were a criminal uh, case. And Bill, you mentioned at the beginning and you're on mute right now, if you could unmute, you mentioned at the beginning before uh, during the social hour that uh, you had recently read a book that suggested that, um, that it was incorrect to have a military tribunal to uh, try civilians. And I think uh, uh, Gail also mentioned that, but can you tell us about what you found in that book? It wasn't a book, it was a law review article in uh, the Columbia Law Review written by- oh, is, that, is, that, is that Letterman? Yes, Marty yeah, Letterman. Yeah. Uh, Liederman, yeah. Oh, uh, beautiful. Is, he is a professor at Georgetown University and an incredibly, incredibly uh, smart guy. Was in the uh, Clinton Justice Department uh, for for a number of years and is now teaching law. But he has done a detailed um, uh, uh, look at the law at the time and his interpretation of um, whether or not it was correctly applied and whether or not a military tribunal was in order. Um, his legal analysis is flawless, but he starts out with the premise that the assassination of Abraham Lincoln was a ordinary run-of-the-mill murder. And uh, the legal authorities that have looked at this, including uh, a federal court in uh, the Southern District of Florida, said, no, this was not an ordinary murder. Lincoln was not killed because he was Abraham Lincoln. He was killed because he was commander in chief of the army. And therefore this was an act carried out uh, in furtherance of a hostile government, in this case, the Confederacy, and that a military tribunal was the proper course. So I, I strongly recommend Marty's article um, and I'll, Kurt, I'll send you the link and you can distribute it however you, you would like. It is on, on the internet. Um, and I, as I said, I think it is very well written. I think uh, his legal analysis is excellent, except that he starts out with a premise that I, I just don't think historical facts supports. Which most of the American people would not have, accept, have accepted at the time, his premise. There were people who did think they should be tried by civilians. And obviously, two years later, two and a half years later, John Surratt was tried by civilians. But at the time, which is, is they didn't believe that. And so it's, again, ah, Gary Gallagher, try to put yourself in their shoes insofar as you can. Well, let, let's not forget. You meant somebody earlier mentioned 9-11. We brought the military tribunal right. back for the exactly. 9-11 exactly. people, whereas others were uh, tried in civilian courts. And there's some controversy about which is correct for the 9-11 people. So history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes, as uh, Mark Twain said. <laughs> uh, I have no sympathy for John Surratt, but... Uh... Of course, when he was tried, the war was over. Yes. Yeah, right. The war was over. It was three years after. People were moving on. They didn't want to think about this anymore. And Plus, if you read about the trial itself, it was very badly handled. They actually, in this trial, one of the counts against him was that he had actually pulled the trigger and killed Lincoln. 
I mean, it was just crazy. It was crazy. So yeah. I'm not surprised it ended in a hung jury. Plus, plus the fact that, uh, you know, by the by eight after Mary Surratt was hung, she mm -hmm. was the first woman ever executed by the federal government. Everybody lost their taste for this. And so when they came back in 1867 to try Sur uh, John Surratt, the war was over. There was no military um, uh, government running Washington. It was a different, it went into the courts. Like uh, like Gail says, and so it was a different, um, uh, you know, a different solution. Uh, uh, but the other thing that, that that's kind of interesting is that the uh, the idea of um, conspiracy. Notice that the, in, in the trial there was one charge, conspiracy, and there were I don't know 16, 17 specifications. Conspiracy was a brilliant idea yes. to, to pursue a trial because conspiracy requires a lower level of proof for conspiracy, as you pointed out, Gail, and you, you know, the, the parts of conspiracy than premeditated murder. So it, it, it allowed you a lesser obstacle uh, to conviction. So it was a brilliant idea, Stanton, Holt, I don't know, whoever. Uh, Holt, I'm pretty sure. Holt was the leading yeah, woman. Yeah. Right. But, well, let's, but, let Norvell, uh, let's let Norvell uh, ask a question. Um, yeah. He was interested in doing that. Uh, yeah, Kurt, I had two questions for Gail. One, when Booth went to Canada, did he meet with George N. Sanders? And then the second question would be, didn't James Speed write a legal opinion published in the Mollus, Ohio Mollus? Um, did who write a, um, an opinion? James Speed. Oh, actually, James Speed, uh, yeah, he backed off this, but it was long yeah. after the assassination, right? I mean, yeah. long after the trial. So this is a nice thing to do. Um, I don't think he met with George Sanders. He met, so far as I know, with a man named Martin Hill who had started out life as a sea captain and something of a blockade runner. And then he got very much involved in Confederate blockade running. And then he was part of the mission in Canada. Now, well, he might have met with Sanders. We don't really know. Booth didn't write anything. We do know he came back with $1,500 and a letter of introduction. But we're not positive who he met with. But he did meet with members of the Confederate mission in Canada. Well, Sanders was actually in Canada there. Yes, he was, yes. Yeah. I suspect he did meet with him, but no proof. No proof. Bill, if you want to ask your question, so basically he wanted to clarify what role uh, Megs uh, had. What, uh, what role he, he, Megs is portrayed in a lot of the uh, uh, depictions of Lincoln at his deathbed. And I was wondering what role he played in the aftermath of the assassination. None, so far as I know. Montgomery Meigs is never never mentioned. None. Why is yeah. why then is he depicted in so many uh, depictions of the uh, Lincoln at his at his deathbed? Well, that was Lincoln at his deathbed, and essentially once the um, okay, Edwin Stanton took over almost immediately and sent up, set up this huge, which some people have called manhunt, which it was, involving multiple military districts, including Lou Wallace, involving military detectives, civilian detectives, but this was Stanton's doing. Stanton went out, uh, led, if you will, the campaign to catch them, and then once they were caught, they moved into the justice system, if you will. Joseph Holt, James Speed. So they were being handled by the justice system. Meigs was at Lincoln's deathbed because I assume he was either a good friend of Lincoln or he wanted to be there. But he was never involved in the assassination, the trial, or the capture 
of these people or the questioning. That was all done yeah. by, by Stanton's troops. Stanton's yeah, that, that, that's my understanding as well. Megs didn't have a role in that. Now, a lot of folks don't understand that Winfield Scott Hancock uh, had a major role. He was in charge of the uh, trial. He was brought to uh, Washington on April 16th. And he was put in charge of the trial, although you never see him in the courtroom except no, to announce the verdicts. The court stuff in any of the, he was involved, was he not, in taking care of the prisoners? And then right. was he in charge of the hanging? Yeah. He was, yeah, he was there. He was the one who clapped three times. And uh, that, that's open to interpretation. There are some that say hot tramp did the three claps and the Hancock did the three claps. Uh, it, it appears uh, the weight of, of historical evidence is a hot tramp after he read the uh, verdicts on the stand, came down and did the three claps until oh. they uh, dropped the traps and the Hancock didn't have a role in that. Um, Gail, we have a question from uh, Dave Gilson uh, asking about if there was any evidence of complicity by the Confederate government in the kidnapping plots or the assassination. No, never any, never any uh, evidence of complicity. Um, never. <laughs> they might have been, well, the complicity would have been um, on the part, sorry, of the Confederate mission, which gave uh, Booth the money and gave him the letter of introduction to the Confederate network in Southern Maryland, but there it ended. Gail, was there any evidence I thought that maybe the Confederate government had uh, their own plot in the works at one oh, point? There, were, there, were, there, there was, was not, there was not, the, Booth was not part of that, but no, they had no, their, no, this was never the Booth plot. The Confederates, right. and if you, the Confederate mission in Canada and the Confederate government had plots. There was apparently a plot to blow up the White House, but none of this stuff ever worked. None of it. It was Booth who did the deal. And it was right. Booth basically acting with, if you think about it, a very small cast of characters, which is probably, if you think about things in terms of, of assassination, the best way to do it. The fewer people who know, the better off you are, the more likely you are to succeed. John Anderson, wasn't there reasonably high support for the verdict I, among me. the newly defeated Southerners waiting to be repatriated? Uh, no. <laughs> um, well, actually, I was surprised. The more reading I did, the more I found that actually Southerners either didn't care that Lincoln was dead. A few of them thought, geez, we're gonna get a better deal under Lincoln to put it very casually. Um, but most people really didn't care. And I don't think they support for the verdict. I didn't run across any of that. Um, so- Of course, of course uh, Robert E. Lee wasn't too happy apparently with the whole thing. And, no, and, Lee was and, not happy. But I don't think he supported the verdict. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. A lot of Lee and a fair number of generals knew that this was going to throw everything into chaos. But I don't want to say that there was support for the verdict. And I don't think that most Southerners really cared. As a matter of fact, there was a lot when Lincoln was assassinated in some places. There was actually jubilation in the South. But Lee was... Lee, Lee didn't really uh, say much of anything about it, other than it seemed like he was disturbed greatly because he seemed to be the symbol for the, uh, the intelligentsia to repatriate the good elements back into the uh, society. So mm -hmm. he was kind of pivotal there. So that's kind of interesting what you're saying, if he didn't actually support the verdicts. I know. Not that I know of. He never commented because, whoa, you know, we need to be very careful. If you think about it from their perspective, we need to be very careful about what we say right. uh, in this regard, mm -hmm. because, you know, especially prominence of them. 
we need to be very careful about what we say. We say, oh, Lincoln would have been wonderful. And I'm so sorry he's dead. I approve of the verdict. They're going to lose support from some of their population. So, and I truly don't believe most of them cared except for the chaos that would be brought about by the death of Lincoln, because at least they knew Lincoln and they knew Lincoln could run the union. And exactly right. what, what they said is exactly what happened, if you think about it. The North, right. the fights between Johnson and Stanton tore it apart, messed everything up. That was terrific. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. It was good to see you all. Um, take care, Susan. <laughs> Oh, right. Monocacy there, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, and Monocacy, go to Monocacy. They cleared a lot of the trees out between the Worthington House and the Thomas Farm so you can see the field of attack. I've been there, of course, but I've heard about it and I want to go. So, All right. thanks a lot, guys. Thank nice you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.